second. Uh, and I'm going to move that. Yeah. Okay. Good evening and, and, and welcome. Uh, I've been told to announcements that this will be recorded. Uh, so if anybody ob uh, objects to being on film, then I'm told they should sit over in the right hand side. So if you've got anything to throw later on, <laughs> sit with Leandro. That will <laughs> cover you. Okay. So. Um, Ian's been in the university quite a long time. Not, not the full 50 years, but it's, it must seem close to that. He was an undergraduate, did his master's, his PhD, he was a postdoc, he was a lecturer, leader, and of course has recently become a professor. Uh, I had a slight role in that. I supervised his PhD, though that's quite a while ago. And it was distinctive. One of the things I remember are the long, detailed discussions we had over those three years, because Ian always wanted to understand the industrial relevance of what he was doing. He wanted the research to actually have an impact, have an effect, to not just be writing papers, though of course he did that, but also to influence the way technology was being developed. And that's quite distinctive. And he's followed it on. Having completed his PhD, of course, he went on and developed and defined his own area of research. But that theme, that idea that he always wanted to influence industrial practice has always been part of his work. And as a result, he can point to many examples of close industrial collaboration. To name just one is work with Rolls-Royce uh, Aero Engines and some representations of that, representatives of that company here, here tonight. So if you've, if you've flown in a large jet with Rolls-Royce engines, then your life, to some extent, has been in Ian's hands because he was involved in defining how the work is scheduled uh, in the control of those, of those jet engines. So his research has had that focus. It's work in an area we call real-time systems and dependable systems, where it's no point in getting the right answer if the plane has already crashed. You need it on time. And you need the software to be incredibly reliable. So even if the hardware fails, the software has got to compensate. And he has, Ian has focused on that work. And I guess he'll be talking about that shortly when I've stopped if I've stopped. <laughs> as well as his research, of course, Ian is an outstanding teacher. His courses are always innovative. He has, brings new ideas to the teaching process. And the courses he's taught on more than one occasion have been voted uh, the favourite courses from, from the student body. But a downside of being good at teaching is that he ends up in currently deputy head of department with responsibility for teaching, which unfortunately slows down his, his other activities. Before giving him uh, the stage, I think we should note a couple of things about his, his hobbies and his pastimes. Ian has a 
distinct combination. He, he combines uh, an extreme liking for extreme sports, kayaking, um, potholing, climbing, mountain bike riding. And he combines that with being incredibly accident prone. <laughs> I point to being flown back from China, having managed to fall over in his bathroom and break various bits of his, his body. Um, so tonight, I want to thank um, his wife Kate, Lucy and Emily for making sure that we got in one piece in order to deliver this talk. It gives me great pleasure to ask Ian now to come up and present his inaugural lecture in recognition of his past work and his current... Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yay. So we need dependability. We need to be able to start things on time. We need to put the microphone on. You can see, I, d I didn't plan that, although maybe I should have done. Uh, why real time is important. It, I mean, Al, you know, Andy and Alan are on the front row of, uh, here, and we, we'd say it's the most important discipline in computer science. And uh, it's my prerogative to say that, and you, you can argue about it at the end of the lecture. Uh, what makes real-time hard? Real-time is quite hard, and it's a hard thing to do, and I'll try and explain why that's the case. So as part of this, I'll talk a little bit about the historical work on computers, uh, real-time dependability. I'll talk a little bit about what came before, time-triggered architecture, and why that prob probably wasn't the right way to do it. Uh, and then I'll talk about the work, the, what we call the York work. So lots of people do priority-based scheduling, but between Andy and Alan, they really set York as the world leaders in this stage. And then I'll talk a little bit about technology transfer successes. That, this bit was written before I knew some colleagues from Rolls-Royce were in the audience, uh, and I haven't changed those slides to say if you can change what I was going to say in advance. I'll then talk a little bit about current challenges and where I think things are going. I'll do a bit less on that. So... It's worth emphasizing real-time is not fast. We often see this in, in kind of the news, people talk about real-time trading, etc. Real-time is not fast. It, and and what, well, one thing I'll motivate later in the talk is why the stri people striving for faster computing is actually making real-time harder. And I, know, I noticed one of my industrial colleagues just nodded at that stage, but we're in a battle. So real-time is about bounded behavior. It's about saying, if I'm going to do something in a certain period of time, it will be finished in that period of time. And because it's dependable, there are real consequences if it's not. And that's fairly clear. So it's quite a hard thing to do to say, absolutely, we will never miss the deadlines that we set. And then as part of this, predictability is important. We need, we need to be able to predict things as part of this process. We need to construct systems in a way 
that actually allows us to give this bounded behavior. And it, it encourages a certain way of designing systems and writing software to, to, and in different programming languages to how other people will do it. So I'll briefly use five attributes of dependability from a person called Jean-Claude Lepre who de defined these terms to illustrate the example. First one's availability. So when the brake pedal in a car is pressed, we expect the hardware and software to respond. Obviously, that's quite important. You can see why that's important. Reliability. If we say that the brakes will be applied within X milliseconds of pressing the pedal, it will be. You know, you, it's fairly obvious. You don't want that to be late. If it's late, there's consequences. Safety. The, obviously, the, the, we want the car brakes to be applied as, quick, uh, as quickly as possible and as we expect. Integrity. We, if the brakes are applied, we expect i.e. we press the pedal, we expect the brakes to come on, or equally, we don't expect the, the brakes to come on when we don't press the pedal. And maintainability. And this is really important. When <laughs> I wonder what I've said now, because Andy's laughing. Uh, maintainability is really important. We need to be able to change software in such a way that we don't have to go through all the effort of reanalyzing it and rescheduling it every single time, because it's really expensive to do. So we need maintainability. And again, this crafts how we do things differently. I'm not going to describe all these things in details. So bounding the execution time of software is very challenging, really challenging. Software is notoriously complex. Sometimes people say things like, well, it's only software, but all the complexity in there. And actually, for what we want to do, that's exactly the wrong answer. So when you buy a car with these fancy infotainment systems, etc., that's really making hard, our job more difficult, or at least Nigel's job more difficult. And simple mistakes can lead to anomalies and outliers. That's where things take a lot longer than we expect. You know, we'll all have had a computer where there's kind of the spinning wheel of death or the hourglass, etc. You don't really want that when you press your braking pedal on a car, you know, for obvious reasons. So we need these dependable real-time systems. So I'll use some examples during this uh, related to construction, because I said I was going to try and use some examples that, that would relate to my parents. So an example is, we say that we want a house building in, in four weeks, and it absolutely will be built in four weeks. It's not just a cost penalty, but actually there's severe consequences to that, that happening. And in some ways, we make ourselves our, our job more difficult. So the way we break down a software system, we say every intermediate deadline is important. So there's complexities from a real-time perspective because of that. So as the way we construct and consider a lot of systems, it's not just the house being completed in four weeks that's important, but that tap being fitted within the next hour. We don't have that level of flexibility in the way we construct and consider scheduling normally. So software is internally complex. So this is a picture of real industrial software of a real critical system. So it's designed to be simple. What this shows, it's like a rat's nest. It's like something we see pulled out of a hair brush sometimes if you've got kids with long hair. But it's, what this shows is the top of the picture is the entry point to the software. And this is all the different paths through it. It's actually a, a control flow graph for a piece of software written in Spark. And as you can gather, trying to predict all the different paths through that and how long each one takes, and then trying to say which is the worst case, that's one level of problem. So the software is internally complex. Also, process have many complex features that make the job even harder. So if you've ever bought a computer, you might have seen people talk about things like caches, etc., on processors. And what this is like is the equivalent of, imagine you're doing a DIY job, and it has significant complexity. And all you can have in your house is five tools and five parts. And what you have to do is work out which five tools and which five parts you need. And then every time you haven't got the right tool or part, you've got to kind of get rid of some to give you spare capacity, go to B&Q, take some quite a while, come back, and, and then you're back to five parts of tools and you can carry on with the job. And what we've got to be able to do is, for each of these possible paths through the job, all the things that can do wrong, we've got to be able to bound the worst case execution time. So it becomes really complex. But that's really simple, because actually, this isn't the only task I'm doing at the same time. I'm doing lots of different tasks, and they're all sharing this cache. So actually, I've got this bucket of, of five tools and five parts, and all the software in your system is sharing those buckets. And you've got to predict how they'll all use this, these, these spare parts. And it gets complex quite quick. 
And that's kind of what, what we do. I could probably stop there, but I'll carry on a bit longer. Uh, so cash is that prime example. It's there to make the job faster, but it makes bounding behavior really difficult. And it makes our job really difficult. And we have to try and manage our resources, work out what to put in the cash, and then sh schedule things accordingly and allow for any potential overruns. What else makes real-time computing hard? If we ask the plumber or electrician to cost a job that under no circumstances could be exceeded, and what I mean there is it, it's not just a case of he takes a loss on the job if it's late, then actually all they'd say is, well, it probably cost about a grand, so I'll, I'll say 10 grand, and I'm, I'm okay there. Obviously, what we can't afford to do is provision computing systems with that type of extra utilization, that level of spare capacity. We can't plan at that level. But actually, if we want to give those hard guarantees, we talk about hard guarantees, we have to do that. Or what they would say is, I'll cost you an absolute fortune to come up with a quote, which I can stick by. And again, that comes into the bit of, we have to do an awful lot of analysis and an awful lot of hard work to enable that. So it comes down to this last statement, which is it's much quicker to write or run software than understand it. And that's very true. And often what we find is we end up coming up with overinflated what we call execution times, time to do the job, and that wastes resources. So we're really stuck trying to get a balance between efficiency and actually giving the guarantees we need. So what did we do? Well, as I said, I didn't know certain people in the audience when I said this. So with Steve Law, we did some work as part of his PhD on bounding the execution time of pieces of software. And we used this clever search algorithm and clever fitness functions to allow us to do that accurately. And we used it on Rolls-Royce software. When I say Rolls-Royce, by the way, it's not the car company. It's, it, as Alan said earlier, it's those plain things that hopefully stay up in the air, even with my software or my contributions on it. And we've, we've demonstrated this on an industrial scale. So with Benjamin Lesage, who's also in the audience, we did, we wrote, he wrote this software. I was going to say we. I think I probably can't take all the credit for it. I think Benjamin might say that. Where actually they automatically checked out all the software out of the databases, uh, did the prediction, and then came up with all the guarantees in a very automated fashion. And one of the benefits we've got now is, well, what's clear is, I see it as a benefit, not everyone academic sees it as this, but we've, I've worked closely with industry and we've had that level of connection to the point at which we've got a rig with a lot of the Rolls-Royce software on where we can carry on doing the experimentation, et cetera, uh, within the department. So, so far we've considered individual tasks. So what I've largely talked about so far is just one piece of software. But actually, a system may have many different software, and actually, a lot of our work has been on scheduling. So it's organizing all those individual tasks and instances of the task job so that they meet the deadlines. So basically, what we say here is events are processed by software tasks. So something happens, someone presses the brake pedal, and then you run this piece of software, which then applies the actuators within the brakes and makes this car stop. And what we want to do is, is to schedule a system, we have to give every task, every job, a fixed execution time, a fixed cost. So that's like the equivalent of saying, how, how much will it be to fit that tap? It's going to be 100 quid. So before, what, there's been two competing co approaches, really. What I might call the Vienna approach and the York approach. So it's time-triggered approaches uh, and the fixed priority approaches that we do in York. Clearly, there's been lots of other academic institutions looking at these types of approaches, but in some ways, we were the, originally, we were the leaders in this. So what happened in time-triggered approaches, every single task, every single job, had a fixed order and position. So this, you do this, followed by this, followed by this, followed by this, and you would never change that order. And what we looked to do was, uh, it, it became very predictable. It, you had a, a cycle that repeated which will illustrate the next slide, but it also has some issues. So let me explain what that is. So imagine you're building a house. Monday of week one of the house build, the, gra the ground is prepared for building. Every Tuesday, because I can have periodic jobs, th things that happen regularly, the plumbers and electricians lay the cables into the foundation. So as part of this, I put some resource to one side that says, oh, I have the plumbers and electricians on site on that day. Wednesday, the concrete is poured, Thursday and Friday, the brickwork is done. If a house was built this fast, I think it would be slightly surprising, but stay with the example. Mon Monday of week two, the roof is put on. 
On the standard periodic uh, Tuesday slot, the plumbers and electricians come in again to do the first fix, and Wednesday the plasters come in. So, you know, you can see if that's a very easy to analyse, very easy to understand the schedule. I'll get criticism on my understanding of house building later, but stay with me. Uh, but what, what if an activity takes less than an hour a day? M imagine we have an activity that takes an hour. Well, actually, we have to break the whole schedule down into hour chunks. So a day's work would be broken up into, say, se seven repeating jobs, and then you'd move on to the next one. Or, if you don't break down the, sh the schedule at the hour level, you could waste a day. So actually, something that takes an hour, you've scheduled the whole day, and then you can't do anything else in the day. Or what you could try and do is pack a number of jobs into the day, but you have to make sure all those jobs fit and can be run in the right order. So this causes some problems. Worse still, if we want to have a job that has a deadline of 10 minutes, so imagine we go back to that example of I press the brakes on the car and I want uh, the brakes to come on in three milliseconds, then you have to run the task every three milliseconds, because otherwise you can't guarantee it responds within three milliseconds. So you've got a situation there which isn't, what we'd say, doesn't make a flexible use of resources. Maintainability or other issues, maintainability might not cover all this, but what happens if it rains on the first Monday and we can't do the groundwork? Well, actually, the whole job fails. You're done. You've got no recovery. You haven't planned for that, but you've got this time to get uh, issue. Well, equally, it also means the plumbers and electricians can't do their work on a Tuesday, but they turn up and you're still paying for them. So you can see there's various problems that come from this type of scheduling. So what we've done, well, I, actually, I'll use the royal weed there. There was quite a bit of work that went on before I joined the group. Uh, I think the group started about three years before I joined. They had a really productive phase and I came in. Uh, we'll leave it there. Someone asked me to try and tell a joke earlier, so I'll, I'll make one. Is we looked at something called non-preemptive static priority-based scheduling, where we give everything a priority of uh, when, when there are various jobs to be done, which one you do first, which one you prioritise in simple terms. And non-preemptive is basically, once you start a job, you finish it, you don't interrupt it to take on another job, which is something I'm not particularly good at doing in my uh, personal life. And then what we had, we have a clever equation which actually allows you to predict the response time of the system. So the R on this slide is the response time, and I won't bore you with the maths. I thought I should put at least one formula in into it, but I, I won't go into details. And obviously, this is a very simple form of this uh, equation, but we, we adopted that. So what does this mean, static priority-based scheduling? Well, basically, we schedule the first fix of electrics and plumbing before plastering. Scheduling, we schedule the plastering before the second fix of electrics and plumbing. We decorate after the second fix is done, etc. So there's a natural priority order there. So if you release jobs, say, in event trigger fashion, we release the brickwork job after we finish the groundworks. Or what we do is release various jobs at the same time, but we know that they're going to run, then going to run in a particular priority ordering. And then you can build your building, you can allow for, if it rains, you've still got your schedule, and you still know what will happen afterwards. It makes resource planning more difficult at one level, but actually gives us various other properties we like. And equally, where we've got multiple resources, and it's important where we've got, say, various decorating jobs, we can have a decorator, and what we do is we deploy the decorator on the first decorating job that needs to be done. So I gave you an example of the analysis, and I tried to find a slightly more complex analysis, but what all I'll say here is some of the analysis gets pretty hurry pretty quickly. And I, funny enough, trying to explain why this is correct and prove this is correct, because remember, there's no part of having this fancy an analysis if the analysis actually is, is flawed mathematically. It becomes trickier. And you get to a stage where a few people understand it properly. So we do have analysis, and we do have more complex analysis that deal with a wide variety of models. So I joined Rolls-Royce in 1994, so the Rolls-Royce UTC University Technology Centre in 1994. At the time, John McDermott was, uh, ran the centre, and Alan Burns led my particular part of the work. And the simple job we had to do was transfer this work we'd done on fixed priority scheduling into industry. And it, it's kind of difficult. It's, 
Because you have an academic model, you have an academic theory, and trying to make it work in practice, that's when you really find out how, how difficult it is. So technology transfer between academia and industry is kind of rare. It, it's, it's rare, and I now know why. The important thing is, people like Rolls-Royce are really good at it. You have to have someone on the other side who actually really believes passionately in what you're doing and puts effort into it. The other thing I would say, uh, it's detrimental to the waistline. So we had to go down to Derby quite a lot. We'd eat a lot of food. We'd drink uh, beer occasionally, believe it or not. And, but that's part of it. And it was interesting, last night was the first time I've seen the people from Rolls-Royce face-to-face in two years. And what did we do? We immediately went out for food and drink. So kind of, if anyone wants to know how to do technology transfer, my guidance is quite simple. Just eat and drink. <laughs> Don't ask about expensive claims. Uh, so what, what we've got basically here is what, what we've done is a traditional academic work. We had to do some work. It wasn't as simple as what it might suggest. So basically, traditional academic work assumes the worst case execution time is known. So how, how long the job takes to execute. I can say what I want about Rolls-Royce now. They've just snuck out the back. They, they've got a 7.30 train. Uh, it assumes most tasks are independent. It assumes there's no overheads. And it assumes that actually you're only juggling 20 to 100 tasks, typically. So this is the particular model where you've got the fixed priority scheduling, you've got this analysis. And what we had to do with Rolls-Royce was allow for some realistic issues. So there's complex dependencies within the system. So you have to do things in a certain order, and you have what we call transactional chains. So as part of that, we, we, we came up with a way of do, doing task attribute assignment, which was a way of taking our fundamental problem and mapping it down into something that the scheduling regime could do. And I do remember a train journey back from uh, Derby where Alan drew a little picture and said, this will work, now come up with some maths for that. And it's like, <laughs> and it actually wasn't that difficult, actually, that little bit. Real systems have overheads. So in most academic work, this magic stuff that does all the planning and organization, working out what to do next, that comes for free. And as anyone knows, there's a couple of people in the audience who have big management roles, like Brian, the dean, and, and John, who's DVC at Sunderland. Management has overheads, believe it or not. So you have to build and allow for these types of overheads in what you're doing. And obviously, you want to manage the overheads in, in an appropriate way. So that's what we did. As Alan said, it, Every, every Rolls-Royce aircraft engine developed since the early 2000s, about 2001, has used the work we did unaltered. And they're st still using the same code base, they're still using the same theory, it's all untouched, which is surprising. I was told they rewrote the software I gave them because it didn't meet the quality standards, which I, I didn't take as a negative thing. They have all sorts of rules about how the software is written and how it's commented, etc. And I should be conscious of the fact that there is a, a teacher of computer science in the room. And I'm only a lecturer. I'm not, I have no formal teaching qualification. And comments and things like that are supposed to be quite important, people say. So the, this was a reflection on the, on the efforts of the community. And now it's a widely adopted approach in avionics. It's widely adopted in automotive, etc. Not all from my work, by the way. But actually, what some people said is, because, because of the work, once you can say someone else has successfully used it and, and it's flying, then it makes your case a lot easier. So we now have a set of principles that allow us to build a simple system. And we have a chance of completing it on schedule. So believe it or not, the software in a, an aircraft engine is actually relatively simple. Still millions of lines of code. Scale and complexity. So, you then get bigger and bigger jobs. So we move on from building a house to things like the Trafford Centre. So it's one of the things my dad did, was read, led that. But then, so you have bigger jobs to schedule, bigger jobs to plan, bigger jobs to profile all the costs, etc. Then what you sometimes have is you have multiple jobs at the same time. So you do things like Wentworth, Trafford Centre, the Deep at the same time. I didn't check the timelines there. I don't think they all happened at the same time. But actually, you get into the point where you're planning multiple jobs, big jobs with all complexities, and you have shared resources. And the shared resources aren't always in the same place. So again, it, it becomes quite complex. So we've had to move on and develop more and more theory to allow us to do these things. So now we have to schedule multiple processes. So that's what we mean, multiple computers at the same time, and get them all to coordinate by networks and make them work. 
The other big problem we've got is actually measuring how long it takes for a piece of software to execute is really complicated. The closer you get to the hardware, you actually get all sorts of what we call measurement noise in there. So it's not just a simple case of pressing the stopwatch. The Vade process of putting the timing things into the software to measure the timings actually interrupts the timings. And it, there's complexity that come. And we get all sorts of noise. So it's quite hard to measure these things. So what we've spent the last period of time doing, or I, I, I've been doing with a team of people, is working on what we call task allocation. I'll explain this in a minute. We've spent about the last 10 plus years working on mixed criticality scheduling, and then about the last five years dealing with uh, shared resources. I'll explain some of these things, if we've still got time. I notice that clock's not working. It's really up. I have no idea how long I've been. Uh, 30 minutes. I'll try and speed up a bit. So task allocation is about mapping the software onto the hardware in such a way that we can schedule each of the processes in a timely fashion. And it's quite a complex thing to do. And we, what we describe it as is, is a bin packing problem. We have to make sure each computer isn't overloaded. Each one has spare capacity. Each one meets its requirements. So I'm going to change the example here and consider I'm running a large removal company that moves uh, boxes, packs up houses around the country. The reason is I was trying to think of a construction example here, and I kind of failed. But I think this l large removal company, people should understand it, hopefully. So the goal is to pack as many houses into a minimum number of vans. So what we want to do is get as much software into the system on the least computers, because it takes physical resources, electricity, and a wide variety of other problems, cooling, etc. We want to be able to unpack all the houses within a, within a deadline. So we have to load up the vans, move the vans around the country, and unpack them, and we have to guarantee those deadlines. And then the roads are analogous to shared resources, so we have things like computer networks. And you've got to think that that's something else we have to manage. And we have to make sure that messages or vans going around the country arrive where they should do on time so that the people unpacking the vans can, can do their job. So it gets quite complicated. I might have said that quite a few times. That's obviously my phrase today. There's a, some other complexities. None of the houses are the same size. None of them are the same distances. Everything's irregular in shape. Anyone who plays Tetris might appreciate this. Houses should be packed in an efficient manner, so you have to think about how you load the van so you can unload the van. Some of the houses have to be packed in a very tight deadline. So imagine, you know, it's all, the van's parking on double led, yellow line, you might have 30 minutes to unpack the house, or you get a fine. And this is the same type of problem. And then what we have to do is, is, is control all our shared resources in a way that we still get this predictable bounded behaviour, and we try to manage things like congestion. So what we can't have is peaks, peaks on the network, peaks on the road, in such a way that some jobs are, are, are late, and then we can't unpack our house on time. And uh, ironically, the lecture was delayed today because there was traffic congestion on the A64 because it was shot. So that's kind of a, a, a timely example. So imagine we're now trying to schedule a massive road network. And the constraints are people will be harmed if anyone is late at their destination. Cars shouldn't run out of fuel or electricity when there are no suitable petrol or charging stations. And my dad told us a story the other day how he met somebody in North Wales near Snowdonia looking, and he's got his you know, fancy pants electric car and he's wondering why there's no, nowhere to charge it. You know, you can't have that. Some cars will break down. But importantly for what we do, it still has to arrive on time, guaranteed. Remember that, we, we, we're, we're dependable. It's no point saying, well, there's a slight problem. We have to be what we call fault tolerant. And any traffic jam should be tightly bounded in advance. So it's okay to have traffic jams, but we have to guarantee it'll be no more than 10 minutes ever, ever. So it's, this is why I'd say we have some good challenges. They're interesting challenges. Often we want to increase the size of jobs, but a little bit more software in. We planned a certain size of van, uh, and then it wasn't quite big enough. And what we might do is we, we don't want to break our schedule, so we don't want to say, let's send a different van and replan it. We want to try and use our, our best van possible. So we could get into this situation with the nice picture. You notice I've not done that many pictures so far, uh, where we suddenly have a van that's slightly heavily loaded by maybe our standards. Or what we also don't want to do is say, well, actually, what I'll do is I'll plan vastly more resources 
and have spare capacity. So you kind of have this road train, like UP, UPS road train, where actually we've got one box and we've sent a, a lorry that size just in case. You know, it, it, it's obviously the, the cost is important. So we did some work on what we call task allocation with uh, a guy called Paul Emerson. And what we did is we looked at how we can allocate the tasks, allocate the packages to the lorries, how we could plan the road network. And then we did what we call scenario-based analysis. So we could do things like, say, uh, insert ra random traffic jams or random amounts of traffic at certain points of time, and then say, does the schedule still work? And what we did is we generate the schedule to be maximally robust. So if two cars break down, everyone still gets to the other end at the right time, et cetera. And again, that was an interesting challenge, and we used kind of what we call simulating the kneeling algorithm to do that. And we still had various other components in here, uh, the analysis of overheads, et cetera. But we've got, we've got some other features within the diagram. That was an interesting piece of work. Our next challenge, because often as academics, we, we, we look at one problem and then we move on to the next one, was mixed criticality scheduling. So basically, what, what, as systems became more complex, it became sensible that it said, if a critical task is taking longer than it should, don't run some low criticality tasks for a while. So stop doing less important jobs, less valued jobs, jobs that potentially are, are not going to have as many consequences as others. doesn't necessarily mean that in, in our world we, often, we, we actually metricate things like the potential of injuries, minor injuries versus major injuries uh, and other situations. And what we might say is certain situations we do less important das, tasks where the effects are really important, say people could be harmed, but not, not the full, full consequences. So we've done a significant amount of work trying to delay the time at which we stop running less criticality tasks and equally return to service when we can start running them again because what we look at is, is we stop running them for a little bit and then we start running them there again. And again, we've been working with the avionics industry. They've left now, but we did some work again with Steve Law uh, and, and Benjamin Lesage working out how many of those low criticality jobs we drop. And this would be kind of a bit like saying, if you're building a house in a state, how many bathrooms do we not fit? Oh, it's gone flat. Oh, it's come back. <laughs> Some systems come back. And ha the, equal, the equal example is, when we're, how many jobs do we not, uh, how many of those jobs that we move around the country with the removal country, company, do we decide not to load and deliver without actually annoying our customer base? And that's kind of what all mixed criticality scheduling is. But it's kept us busy and it's kept Alan very excited for a while. So what, what we did is, is we've looked at various what we call policies for mixed criticality scheduling. Again, we've looked at task allocation. So one of the things you want to do is then position software on systems so that you lose as few of those jobs as possible. And we've done some work in there and it's been quite interesting. And again, we work with people like Benjamin Lesage. Again, his name keeps popping up. David Griffin, Alan and Rob Davis have been involved in this. So that's what we've been doing more recently. However, sometimes the effects of t timing become so large. There's something called the missed status hit register. And this is a situation where a job suddenly takes 100 times longer than we expect. At the moment, we don't really have a way of dealing with that in scheduling. So we have this thing. One of the things we develop our systems do is in case of catastrophic situations, we turn them on and off really quickly. So no one will notice. And it works. But it's, it's the last resort. Sometimes in construction, that's not the case. So this is the Arndale Center after the IRA bomb. And you had six weeks to get it back open so the Queen could reopen it. So construction, they've got solutions to this, albeit it was probably quite stressful at the time. For, mixed, for what we do, we don't have that type of solution. It's beyond what we, can, we currently can cope with in an elegant fashion. But that's okay. It keeps us interested. So we've got to a situation where potentially our models are that advanced, our problems are that advanced, we can't reason about the made priori. So the important thing to note so far, and probably I should have said earlier, is we have to give all these guarantees before we ever use the system. Because you can't really fly the aircraft until you know it's going to work. You don't know it's going to work until you fly it. So what we started doing is saying, arguably, the best model of the system is the system itself. 
And what we want to do is create models, almost a live system, that allow us to validate them. And we use the real system. Uh, we generate the real system and validate a model that we have that we use as our guarantees as we go. And this gives us various other benefits, including things like maintainability. So at this stage, I was out for a walk with someone the other day, and they said, every talk needs animation. So I'm going to try some animation, because I don't normally do animation, because my view is animation is something industrialists do to hide the, the fact that there's a lack of content. So I, I'm going to try some animation. Let's see if it works. So what we want to do is learn a model of the system by observing the system, build a system based on these models, and go from there, and then continuously learn and refine our model. So what we've basically got is a situation where we'll have a physical plant, we'll have the models of the system, and we have what we call a digital twin. So what we do is we run the system in a, in a safe environment, and we learn a model as we run. We refine the model to make it more accurate, so it's sufficiently accurate for the role we do. And then we'll use that model as part of our scheduling solution to make sure things run on time. Now, what we might end up doing is using a very simple, very conservative model at first, where everything is overinflated, and then make it tighter and tighter, and that allows us to, say, put more software into the system. The, the hard thing there is then to decide what is the most appropriate model. And how do we refine the model? I'm doing some work on, uh, with a variety of people uh, that are in the audience again. Uh, Shwai, Benjamin, and St Stephen. Uh, I, don't, I think Stephen's here. And hold on. The animation's working. Stay with it. Are you impressed? No, he's not. So what we've basically got, I can see his eyes, he's like, oh, really, is that all you've got? That's the best you could do? Uh, I've only been lecturing 20 odd years, bear with me. Uh, so we've got a target system on the left hand side, you've got digital twin in the loop, and what we've got is the system on one side, we've got a variety of models on the other side, and we've got a continual field feedback. And we're gonna try and do this in live systems to optimize the performance of those systems. Hold on, bear with this problem with animation. Nothing happens quickly. Uh, it's no good. So let's look at some similarities and differences. That Honestly, I've almost finished. So uh, dependable real-time systems and construction and logistics. Logistics is kind of your van loading thing. You've got complex scheduling and allocation problem. Check both sides. I think that's OK. On a dependable real-time system, once the plan is fixed, we have to live with it. Possibly on construction and logistics, it's more easy to, to change things as we go. If the, requirements are, if the requirements are not met, there's a typo on the slides, darn it, then the consequences may be severe. Whereas actually, in something like construction and logistics, there's a financial penalty, but no one's going to be harmed. And that's, that makes it slightly different. There are, on the dependable real-time systems, there are many, many shared resources to manage. So on one of the systems we looked at, there was 135 shared resources, all of which the different tasks can contend with and trying to manage all those. And it becomes really challenging. Again, to construction, you've still got shared resources, but potentially slightly easier to manage. There is competition for shared resources, but not necessarily outside the system. So dependable real-time systems, all the competition for resources are inside your system. In, in something like construction and logistics, for instance, I talked about uh, vans driving around on the road, but the van's not in my control. Uh, and what we tend to have is quite closed systems. So that's a, compl a, a complexity on the other side that we don't know what we have. What we are scheduling is complex, and we often fail to understand it properly. Whereas uh, what, what they are doing on the construction and logistics side, it, it, it is a complex problem but they often understand it well. And that's one of the things we're trying to address with Digital Twin. Software does exactly what we tell it to. So we, if we write, write a piece of software and the schedule fails, we failed. Whereas in something like construction logistics, you tell someone to fit a tap in a certain way and, well, what, what could happen? Anything could happen. But software always is repeatable. So any failure is our fault. And most scheduling failures are under our control in the dependable real-time systems, where on the other side, they're not necessarily all un under our control. So that's the, the main body of the talk so far. Well, it's, it's the whole talk, really. Uh, but I just thought I'd end with this, because I quite like it. So what is academic research about? Well, this is kind of it. 
So in top left, that's part of my PhD family, just before COVID lockdown, by the way. And there's a few of the people and family that I've had as PhD students. There's a wider group than that, but that's really important to me. In, in the top middle, you've got what we call an RTS barbecue. I couldn't find a picture at Andy's house. It always used to be at Andy's house, and then he retired, so we had one at ours a few years ago. We have Neil Audsley's leaving do in top right. Again, it's social, there's drinking, there's food. Neil's not there. There's a story behind that. And then I've got to travel some great places and often take the family. So China, Virginia to see Jack Stankovic, who Alan knows. St. Louis to see Chris Gill. I, I was part-time for five years as a professor in Sweden. They made me a professor before here. I just want to point that out. And, and then... Uh, in, in Graz, in Austria, where we had a chance to visit. So kind of academia is, it, it's, it's that social element again. It's drinking and eating, meeting people, etc. And that's kind of all I've got to say. Uh, so thanks for your attention and hope it was okay, uh, thank understandable. You. <laughs> Although we're running late, uh, we've still got time for some questions either on real-time systems or house building. <laughs> any, any questions that people would have had? Yeah. Ian, have you ever sat on a plane next to somebody and said to them, I wrote the software for this? <laughs> no, but actually, I was, yeah, Kate, Kate's put her hand up immediately. I was once on the plane. I'm not, I, I'm not comfortable flying before I got involved in this. I was looking a bit nervous. Maybe Kate should tell the story. And, and there was this nice, really nice old lady sat next to me said, trying to make me feel better. said, oh, son, you'll be OK. What do you do for a living? And, and she, I didn't answer. I, was, I wasn't in a good place at the time. I, you know, they hadn't served the drinks by that stage. And Kate said, he works on safety critical software with the people who developed this engine. <laughs> I, she didn't speak to us for the rest of the flight. <laughs> Hope that answers your question. But that's a true story. Any other? Yeah, John. Oh, God, this is going to be a technical question. I, I, shouldn't have, I shouldn't have told you about the event. I'm going to regret this now. <laughs> no, that was really great, Ian. Thanks. In terms of a lot of the stuff you talked about was um, no kind of um, randomness, so everything was predictable. What about systems that have elements of randomness in? Well, even the random, I'd say even the randomness is, is predictable. You know, so we have things called random number generators. They have a very defined equation. They have a seed. Everything is under our control. There's a level at which everything is deterministic. But do we want to bother to go to that level and, and understand the impact of a certain seed and random number generator and then exactly how the random numbers generate coming out? So one of the things we do as part of our experiments is we have repeatability. So they're random, but we can actually run exactly the same experiment multiple times and get exactly the same result until you get to multi-core, by the way, and then all bets are off because it's things we just, that are, are harder to understand, but you'd still be able to understand them if you had the lifetime of the universe to do it and you could be bothered spending that much time trying to understand it. So in a computer, everything has a fixed sequence and a random number generator. I know that Sam Braunstein isn't work here from the quantum part, but I think Susan might say, that's not entirely true. But in the world we work in, in the predictable software, everything can be determined. It's whether you can be bothered to go to that level and whether you can afford to go to that level. Andy. Oh, that was okay. You know the modern cars will break when you don't put your foot on the brake pedal. <laughs> yeah, but that's still under the control of software. It's a piece of software that says, oh, he's obviously not concentrating. Uh, let, let's break. So it's still a piece of software, and, and still you have to guarantee that say, you, you still need guarantees, although there's an issue of what integrity level that would be, is that the car detects the object in front and starts to apply the brake within a certain period of time. So thanks for that. But it's still a real, it's still a real time problem, Andy. But I think actually it's also slightly disconcerting. Uh, my, my wife's favorite activity is when our car parks itself. And, and she, she really enjoys that moment in our lives. Does it take a dependable person to build a dependable real-time system? No, I don't think so. Uh, uh, I don't Evidently think not. so. Uh, Alan, any views on that? No, it, 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 what it takes is many people. 
Because what you have is you have a process of some people do some work and then some other people check it. So when we were going to certification with the fixed priority work, one of the things that was really important to them is all the papers had been peer reviewed, been checked by other experts. So you have a lot of checks and balances. Everyone can make a mistake, but what you hope is through, through other ways you can validate that what you're going to do is correct. And you go through a rigorous regime to achieve that. But yeah. It do, does it require a dependent person? Does it require a certain type of person? I think it does. A certain mentality of not rushing. Everything is done very, very slowly in dependable real-time systems. Or slower than normal. Okay, any more final last question? I think everyone anyone? wants wine. Lay. Yes. a lot of uh, logistic or manufacturing things. I'm just wondering, so nowadays a lot of, uh, especially the car manufacturer, is adopting what they call the just-in-time manufacturing process, whatever that is. It's kind of like the real-time system. All the parts should arrive on time at the correct time without delay. So I'm just wondering, have you compared both algorithms, well, the algorithm on both sides, whether it's the same algorithm or they are doing something differently or they are learning from us? Thank you. No. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, I, I would imagine they, they use quite complex task allocation problems. So the task allocation problems are talked about. Uh, there's a guy called Ed Burke in Nottingham who was doing some interesting work on on traffic planning for uh, air traffic control. And he was considering what happens, say, if ship holes shuts down because of fog, as it usually does, how you reroute things and ramp plan things and get things right in the right place. So they'll be using complex task allocation approaches that dynamically adapt. So they, they look at things like what spurs they've got and work out what they have to order and how to route things around the country. And again, they've got a similar problem that locally to the factory, they have a depot of certain size where they store parts and they can only store so many parts and they need so much paint, they need so much of this. So, so the, some of the approaches will be quite similar, but they only have economic consequences if something goes wrong. And that, that's the difference. If they lose a few hours on the production line, it, yeah, it's a big problem, but... Our problems are slightly different to that. You'd be reassured that the people we talk to in industry put quite a lot of effort into getting things right. <laughs> With that optimistic note, <laughs> let us all thank Ian again for the fine talk and congratulations. Thank you. I'm sure there's other things to do now. <laughs> I'm not sure what. David, anything to do? Is the drink still out there? Or... <laughs>